Now as we move on, we have a problem. McBride uh, uses external validity in a way that I really can't work with. Uh, she defines external validity as behaviors can be applied to real life settings and being able to apply the results to individuals not in the study. And, you know, I agree with the second way that she's using it, but not the first. Uh, you know, my use, and this is based on Cook and Campbell, uh, the applied social psychology uh, research method uh, geniuses, uh, you know, they use the terms like this. Uh, you know, the part of the definition of McBride's where it says behaviors can be applied to real life set, uh, settings or situations, they use the term ecological validity. And I'll define that in a minute. And uh, they use, and I use, external validity uh, for the other part of McBride's definition, being able to apply the results to individuals or situations not in the study. So now let's get on to how I talk about external validity. Uh, external validity, according to Cook and Campbell, how well the results of your study can generalize to different frames. Generalize means apply. So if I have an experiment about, uh, you know, wolves, uh, you know, could I generalize the results of what I find on wolves to dogs? Well, I don't know. But applying whatever you find in your study on wolves to dogs is called generalization, generalizing your results. And uh, by different frames, Cook and Campbell mean different people, different types of people, different settings, that is, different situations, different places, and different times, that is, 1990 versus 2015. And according to Cook and Campbell, to have good external validity, uh, you have to include different frames in your experiment. That is, to be able to apply, it makes no sense if you do an experiment on wolves to apply what you find on wolves to dogs. And so to really be able to talk about dogs, you have to have wolves and dogs in your experiment together. That is, you have to uh, have all the examples of everything you want to generalize to in your experiment. And only then can you have good extraneous, uh, excuse me, external validity. Only then can you have good external validity. You have to include every different frame you want to generalize to in your experiment itself. Uh, so uh, McBride uh, illustrates this point perfectly in her chapter on sampling. And she talks about how convenient samples lower the external validity of a study. And she's absolutely right. And while I was talking about wolves and dogs before, let's get to a psychology example. Uh, let's say that a, a researcher uses a convenient sample of Harvard male students from the research pool uh, and draws conclusions about moral development. Uh, so I ask you, how comfortable would you be with applying the results of this study, uh, that researcher's study? They only used Harvard male students uh, to study morality and moral development. How comfortable would you feel about applying the results of this study to women and people of color? Uh, how comfortable would you feel if, when applying them or generalizing the results from male Harvard students to women and to uh, African Americans, how comfortable would you feel if the researcher says, well, according to my research, women and, and people of color are not as morally developed as white males? And now you start to see the, the problem with this type of generalization. And so that would be low external validity. Uh, that is, you didn't include examples of the people you wanted to generalize to in your experiment. You didn't have women in your experiment. You didn't have African Americans in your experiment. And so it makes limited sense to apply the results of your study uh, to those people. And uh, I'm not making up this example. Uh, look up, uh, look up Lawrence Kohlberg and Carol Gilligan, and you'll see that this exactly happened. Uh, 
uh, Kohlberg did experiments on Harvard males and developed a very, very famous theory about uh, moral development. And then when he started to test females, he discovered that women are, you know, have no moral development compared to men. Uh, and uh, this is mainly because he did not study women in his original experiments. Uh, and so, therefore, you need to include the frame of people in the experiment. And there was no different examples of people uh, are not included in the experiment. So, therefore, you can't generalize beyond male Harvard students or males, maybe. That's the external validity uh, McBride and I agree about. What we don't agree about is ecological validity. I think she wanted to try to keep the book simple, but I feel that this makes it a little bit too simple. Uh, ecological validity is all about avoiding the artificial. As psychologists, we want to study natural behavior. And if we create an artificial situation in an experiment, people are going to respond to that artificially. And so therefore, we'll be studying artificial behavior. So. What we want to do is create a naturalistic situation, which will allow us to, uh, you know, create natural behaviors, and so we can observe and study natural behaviors. So ecological validity is, is basically how naturalistic the setting is, and so we can rank uh, studies on helping from the most ecologically valid, that is the most natural, to the least natural or the most artificial. So let's say I do an observational study on helping in the subway. It's a natural setting. It's observational, so I'm not, as the experimenter, interacting with anybody. I'm just observing. And so therefore, this is a perfectly natural, true-to-life situation. This has perfect ecological validity. Uh, what if I do a field study on helping in the York Atrium with a confederate? Uh, again, uh, it's a field study. So subjects are not even aware they're subjects until we debrief them. Uh, and it's in a natural setting. I do have a confederate interacting with them, but the confederate is playing the part of another student. So uh, at face value, that's still pretty natural. Uh, depending upon what the confederate does, it may be perfectly natural. Now we go to a laboratory study on helping. And in that laboratory study, you help other people by sending them Scrabble tiles. Uh, now, first off, you're in the laboratory. That's not a natural situation. Second, you normally don't help people by sending them Scrabble tiles. You probably don't know what a Scrabble tile is. Uh, so now we're getting even more artificial. And then finally, as an experiment on helping, I give you a survey, and I describe on paper, different situations, and I ask you to circle a number to indicate how you respond in those situations. Uh, we don't usually interact with other people by reading about something and then circling a number. Uh, so that's very artificial, very low ecological validity. And then finally, statistical conclusion validity. Uh, and this is really about uh, you know, I want to focus here on test reliability. Uh, and this is the only part of statistical conclusion validity you'll have to worry about for this class. Uh, unreliable tests add error variance to the data. And error variance decreases statistical power. So you really have to make sure that, you know, reliable tests are being used. And the rubrics that I've given you for reliability, uh, and again, uh, McBride talks about this and the measures of it in the textbook. Uh, 0.71 is the bare minimum. Uh, about half of the test score is error. Uh, you know, a reliability of one has no error, and it's pretty much impossible. Uh, 0.8, or a reliability in the 80s, is considered moderate reliability. And, uh, you know, uh, reliability measures in the 90s, 0.90s, are considered relatively good and, and fantastic. So always make sure that you have a reliable test or that the researchers that you're reading about have reliable tests. OK, so that's it for the validities. What does this mean in terms of your paper and its conclusions? Well, first off, uh, your methodological conclusions. 
uh, you can summarize or categorize studies based on validity. That is, uh, you can summarize uh, all of your studies based on uh, the types of validities that they're good on or they're poor on. So you can say things such as, uh, all the studies had very poor ecological validity. And then you can explain why for each study. Uh, or you can categorize the study. Some had good external validity, some had bad external validity, but only the externally valid studies found support for the relationship between the IV and the DV. And so that's how you can use, it. You know, use these types of validities to organize and categorize what you're talking about. And then you can use the validities to give yourself future directions. Uh, that is, you have to give recommendations in one of the areas for the paper. And so you can use this to recommend future research methods of the studies you want to do. So if most of the studies that you reviewed have poor ecological validity, then one of your recommendations for future directions would be uh, you know, to do studies with greater ecological validity. And then if that's not enough summing up, let's uh, go the rest of the distance and really sum up everything in the course. Uh, and I just want to point out and remind you that extraneous variables or any variable other than the IV or the DV, confounds are an extraneous variable which co-varies with levels of an independent variable. Uh, I've told you confounds are bad, but what about ex extraneous variables? Well, they're neither good nor bad. Extraneous variables are bad uh, in that they could become confounded. And for some you know, experimenters, um, myself included, that's so horrible that it's, confounds are so bad that you don't want to have extraneous variables in your experiment just because they could possibly become confounded. So they're just so bad, even the possibility of that, you want to get rid of extraneous variables. Uh, however, uh, in terms of external validity and increasing the external validity of your experiment, uh, having more you know, subject variables in your experiment, uh, that will you know, increase the external validity of your experiment. Uh, so in that way, you know, different subject variables are extraneous variables. That is, having male and female subjects, that's gender is varying, so that's an extraneous variable. It's not confounded, uh, hopefully, so in this case the extraneous variable is good. Uh, however, statistics, uh, error variance. Error variance is the error in your experiment. And to illustrate that, there's the T uh, formula for the t-test. And in the denominator, underneath the uh, square root sign or symbol, we have the variance of the two groups, the control and uh, treatment group. And as variance gets larger mathematically or algebraically, uh, t will get smaller. And a smaller t is uh, not likely to be reach levels of significance. And so what that means is uh, statistical power is inversely related to error variance. And what that means again is extraneous variables cause error variance. Because you have different types of people, males, females, left-handers, right-handers, uh, you know, uh, extroverts, introverts in your experiment, they're different and so they're going to have variance. And that variance goes into the denominator, and so it's going to make your t value smaller, less likely to be reach levels of significance. So in this case, extraneous variables are bad because they increase error variance, which lowers your statistical power. So I can really wrap up the entire course right here. Uh, first, internal validity is inversely related to ecological validity. That is, uh, the fewer confounds you have, uh, the fewer risk of confounds, the more controlled your experiment is. Control will you know, remove those confounds. The more artificial it's going to be. And the more artificial an experiment, the less ecologically valid. Uh, you really can't have an ecologically valid and internally valid experiment at the same time. You just can't. Uh, 
Also, external validity is inversely related to statistical power. And so the more uh, inclusive the frames in your experiment are, uh, the lower statistical power you're going to have. And so you're not going to be rejecting null hypotheses. You're not going to be supporting your hypotheses. And you're not going to get published. So that's a problem. Uh, and also internal validity. Having good internal validity is problematic when external validity is high. If you want to have high external validity, you have to include different frames. Uh, and those are extraneous variables. And they could problematically become confounded and ruin your internal validity. Uh, so uh, those two are problematically related. And this comes back to what I've been talking about all semester long. We have to look at replications and extensions. We have to look at programmatic research. Because if you cannot conduct one experiment that's perfect, then what you're going to have to do is conduct a series of experiments. Each one in its own way is perfect. And then stitch them together to make some uh, conclusion about a phenomenon you're interested in.